This atmosphere is, I think, is is ready. And for those who who feel like it's, you know, just part of the program, you know, it's just part of the the schedule, the agenda, worship, preaching, worship, preaching, worship, preaching, worship. The worship, the, the, the time of worship is there to set up for the word of God that is, is going to come. The time of worship is, is for us to, to get ourselves in line with the Lord, get our, our, our minds, our, our spirits in line with what the Lord has for us on, on, any, given, on any given day. And so I'm... I'm hopeful that that this time of worship has done just that, that our minds and our spirits are, are ready to receive the word. If you would uh, find your Bible or on your, on your phone or just follow along on the screen, Proverbs chapter 18. Starting with verse 20, Proverbs 18, starting with verse 20. Um, Most of the scripture I'll be reading, um, I'll be reading the New Living Translation, so it'll sound a little different from what you see on the screen. Proverbs 18, starting in verse 20. Wise words satisfy like a good meal. The right words bring satisfaction. The tongue can bring death or life. King James says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. There are, I think, maybe five or six of you here who... I've already heard this, but you're going to hear it again, and uh, a little bit different. But today, TLC, I'm I'm here to bring you a word uh, on the subject, life or death. Life or death. When When we speak, it is a matter of life or death. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for for this atmosphere that you have set up. Thank you, Lord, that you are not so distant that we can't call on you. I'm thankful that you are as close as the mention of your name. And in that we find peace, we find comfort, we find rest. We find restoration in that presence, in that name. I ask, Lord, that that our our hearts, our minds would be softened, would would be ready, Lord, to receive this word. And not just to hear it, but to live it. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done here and what you're getting ready to do. We honor you. We bless you, and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Uh, You can all be seated. In the spring of 1692, a couple of young girls in colonial Massachusetts began began to display unexplained strange behavior described as throwing fits. They were screaming. They were throwing things. They were contorting their bodies in strange ways. They were wedging themselves under furniture. And when brought before the local magistrate, the girls accused three women of practicing witchcraft. A slave named Tichuba, a homeless beggar named Sarah Good, and a poverty-stricken elderly woman named Sarah Osborne. Good and Osborne claimed innocence, but uh, Tichuba 
uh, confessed that the devil had told her to serve him. And she went on to describe these strange visions that followed. All three women were jailed, and paranoia began to spread throughout the community, and a steady stream of accusations soon followed. And the hysteria reached new lows when Sarah Good's four-year-old daughter was questioned, and her shy and timid responses were taken to be a confession. On May 27, 1962, Governor William Phipps established a special court to address the growing concern of witchcraft throughout Salem and surrounding areas. Bridget Bishop was the first to be tried in this court. She was found guilty, though she maintained her innocence. And Bridget Bishop was the first to die as a result of the now infamous Salem witch trials. She was hanged on June 10th at what was later called Gallows Hill. Not everyone had bought into the witch hunt craze, however, and and some pleaded with the court to change the way that the trials were being held, uh, asking to disallow spectral or supernatural evidence and only to consider the evidence that they could see, the tangible, the natural. But these requests at first fell on deaf ears, and eventually public support as a whole for these trials began to diminish, and and, uh, Governor Phipps, in response to the pleas for fair trials and and the fact that his own wife was now on trial for being a witch, Governor Phipps stepped in and stopped further arrests, and he released those who had been accused who were awaiting trial, and he dissolved this, this court to replace it with a new one that now did not allow spectral evidence, and through this new court, only three of 56 accused were condemned. In May of 1963, Governor Phipps released from prison all those convicted of witchcraft. But despite these measures, the damage had already been done. Nineteen were hanged on Gallows Hill. A 71-year-old man was pressed to death with heavy stones. Several died in jail, and nearly 200 overall had been accused of witchcraft. In the years that followed, many involved with the Salem witch trials publicly realized the error of their ways. In 1711, the colony passed a bill clearing the names of those convicted and accused and paid restitution to the family and heirs of the accused and convicted. There's an old saying that goes something like, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. It's one thing to learn about history, but something entirely different to learn from history. So what do we learn from the Salem witch trials Uh, in in context with the scripture I read to you just a a few moments ago? uh, Rumors, mob mentality, scapegoating, those, those things, speaking ill of other people, gossip, it can be destructive. They are at best hurtful and at worst lethal. What you say about people can be just as, if not more deadly than what you do to them. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Gossip and rumors don't just hurt the person being spoken of, but they can also affect those who hear it. Many people don't bother to to verify what they hear and just go along with what's being said. Last year is a perfect example of this. We saw destruction all around the country because people watched some 30-second videos on Twitter and built their entire opinion on that 30-second video, not caring to figure out the facts, not caring to figure out what really happened, not caring to, 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 to who they hurt or who, who they, 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 uh, they, they, they uh, damaged in any way. There was no, it, it, was, it was, I just want to be first to know, and I'm first to know very very little about what actually happened, and so now I can go act on what I don't really know. Many people don't bother to, to check what they hear. They just want to be first. They don't care about facts, and they just go along with what's, what they're being told or what's being, what's being talked about. And their view of or their relationship with the person being talked about is now colored by whatever rumor is being spread. And I would, I would say to you that, that this is even stronger when it's happening within a family unit. When you have a, 
When you're cooking a stew or a soup or a chili, the longer you leave it to cook, the, the stronger and more intense the flavors become. And so it is when, when you gossip in your own house and you, you talk about people in your own family, the, those, those feelings you have toward that person become stronger and more intense. And before you know it, you can't tell the, the gossip from the truth. You can't because all you see when you see that person is, is the opinions and the, the ill speaking and, the, and the, the, the bad things and all the negative stuff that, that you in this little melting pot have, have been sitting there for years and years talking the, the same bad stuff about a person and then you can't really see past the negative stuff that you're talking about that person. And so your, your worldview is colored by, by these things that, that are being told to you. You're not guarding your mind. You're not guarding your ears and you're just allowing what's coming in to come out. Garbage in, garbage out. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 19 says, a gossip goes around telling secrets so don't hang around with chatterers. James chapter 3, starting in verse 2, says, Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect, we'd be mature, we would be complete, and also could control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth, and a, a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. If we sidetrack very quickly to Proverbs 26 and 20, it says, Fire goes out without wood, and quarrels disappear when, gossips, when gossip stops. Think about that. Your tongue is a fire. What, what great uh, a fire a, a, a small spark kindles, right? When we, when we speak uh, and we speak ill of someone or we speak negatively, it is incendiary. It, it, it begins a, a, to, to start a fire. But Proverbs tells us fire goes out without wood. So you you may hear someone start a fire, but if you don't add fuel to it by passing it on to the next person, you don't add fuel to it by, by giving credibility to the person who's spreading the rumors in the first place, that fire goes out and the quarrel disappear because you have stopped the gossip. Continuing on in James chapter 3 from verse 7, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, that is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you cannot draw fresh water from a salty spring. You say that you want to see your friends and your classmates and your co-workers and your family come to the Lord. You want to see them saved. You want to see them in the house of God. But then you proceed to spread rumors and gossip about the very same people or the people that they're connected to. James chapter 1 in verse 26, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Don't get upset with me, that's James that said that. Your religion is worthless if you can't hold your tongue, if you can't watch what you say. Your religion is worthless. All this, it doesn't mean anything. Pure, and it goes on in verse 27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. You're a whole lot less likely to start talking about people and, 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 and speaking ill of people and spreading rumors and, and causing division if you do not allow the world to corrupt you in the first place. Show of hands, if you have played the game telephone at some time in your life. Okay, most of you. 
Uh, for those of you who are not sure what that is, uh, you, you line up a bunch of people and you, you, you whisper a phrase to the first person and then they have to whisper that phrase to the next person. And then by the very end of the line, you have to see if you end up with the same phrase you started with. And it almost never works. Most often what will happen, the first person will, will start with, a, you know, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And by the time it reaches the last person, it's thank goodness for tagless t-shirts. <laughs> and that's telephone. It's funny when it's a game, but we do this with people's lives. We do this with people's lives. We do this with people's reputations. We get some information about someone that we have to tell someone about. And by the time the 10th person has heard it, it's not even remotely close to the truth, assuming that the first thing that was said was the truth in the first place. And now that person's life and reputation is damaged or altogether ruined. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18 Hiding hatred makes you a liar. Slandering others makes you a fool. Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. The words of the godly are like sterling silver. The heart of a fool is worthless. That, that, that whole thing about, you know, if you don't have something nice to say about someone, don't say it at all. That's good, that's good stuff. That's, that's biblical. If you don't have something nice to say, don't say it. Otherwise, you're a fool. You want to slander other people? You're a fool. Again, don't get mad at me. I'm, I'm just quoting scripture. Proverbs 18, verse 7, a fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Words have weight. Words matter. What you say matters. Who you say it to matters. How you say it matters. We must be careful about what we say and to whom we say it. Gossip and rumors have been around uh, pretty much forever, but the way in which they are spread has evolved. It's no longer just me telling you face-to-face or whispering stuff to you. It's no longer just calling someone up on the phone. Social media has opened up a whole new world of, 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 of opportunity for people who like to gossip, for people who like to spread lies and spread rumors. People say things about other people on social media that they would never say to their face because they can hide behind a screen. I call it keyboard courage. You don't, you don't, you don't have any consequences when you, when, you, when you type something about someone and post it for all the world to see, and that person's not there to pop you in the face for saying that because you're behind a screen, you're behind your phone. And so you, you feel a lot more courageous. You feel a lot more bold to say whatever it is you want to say because there's, there's no real-time consequences. But it doesn't change the fact that your words matter. It doesn't change the weight and the impact of your words. Matthew 12 and 36 is, is a warning. And I tell you this, you must give an account on Judgment Day for every idle word you speak understand that when you write or when you type something it is an extension of your speech it's not just it's not just that you'll give an uh, uh, an account of every idle word that you've spoken but the things that you write the things that you type the things that you post on on the internet those things are an extension of what you are saying and so those two will be uh, something that you have to give an account for on judgment day those two carry weight in in the, the grand scheme scheme of eternity. What you say matters. There is death and life in the power of the tongue. Proverbs chapter 6 verses 16 through 19 list seven things that the Lord hates. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. Quite often lies are at the heart of rumors. So when we just can't wait to go tell someone what we heard about someone else, or we just go knowingly spread a lie about someone, we create division between people. We are adding up the things that the Lord hates. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get mixed up in the things that the Lord hates. Luke chapter 6, in verse 45, 
A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. After the time of Joseph, the Israelites found themselves enslaved under Egyptian rule for over 400 years. Generation after generation knew only hard labor. They knew only building shrines and temples for Egyptian gods. The Israelites were eventually freed under the leadership of Moses, and they go on to cross the Red Sea on dry ground to forever escape their Egyptian taskmasters. But while they may have escaped their physical taskmasters, I submit to you that God's people were not yet truly free. As Moses was on Mount Sinai for the sixth time, this time for 40 days and 40 nights, the Israelites became impatient and they built an idol in the form of a golden calf. It's even suggested by some historians that this idol was a representation of the Egyptian bull god Apis. And so again, while they had escaped Egypt physically, Egypt had not escaped them. Either way, idolatry was a way of life in, e- way of life in Egypt. Uh, so the Israelites left Egypt, but, but Egypt was still in them. All throughout Moses' time leading the Israelites, there are countless mentions of people speaking out against Moses and or God himself. There are rebellion after rebellion after rebellion. And on, and, and on some occasions, those speaking out make it a point to say it would have been better just to stay in Egypt. I would submit to you that they were speaking out of the abundance of their heart. Millions of people who saw the the power of God time and time again. They saw his power through, through the plagues. They saw his power through, uh, through, through the, the, the sea being parted for them to walk on dry ground and watching the sea come back together to wash away their past. They, 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 they see the power of God providing for them uh, uh, manna and quail and water out of a rock and, and, and their clothes and shoes never wore out. And they, 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 they see time and time again the power of God but their heart's not quite in it. Their heart's not there. And so when they go to speak, they're speaking out of the abundance of their heart. And out of the abundance of their heart is not, God has been so good to me. God has blessed me. God has taken me out of, out of a horrible situation. Yes, this doesn't seem great that we have to be in the wilderness for a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's not ideal. It's not what I thought it would be. But God has been so good. That's not what was in the abundance of their heart. The abundance of their heart was bitterness. The abundance of their heart was, was, was ungratefulness for what God had done. And so they, they rebel and they speak out. And, 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 and we go on to find out shortly that life and death are in the power of the tongue. In Numbers chapter 13, 12 spies are sent out to scout the promised land. Ten of those twelve returned full of doubt, and of the abundance of their hearts, their mouths spoke. Because these ten men spoke doubtfully of entering the promised land, they never lived to see it, as the Lord caused the Israelites to wander the desert for forty years. Death and life was in the power of their tongues. As the Israelites crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and watched their oppressors washed away as the sea came back together, so it is when we are baptized. It's the beginning of a new life. We see our old life washed away. We see our sin washed away in the waters of baptism. And as the Israelites followed the Lord's leading as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, so it is when we are led of the Spirit. But then we become frustrated and we become impatient when things don't go the way we think they should go. And we begin to murmur and speak ill of our leaders or worse yet, speak ill of God himself. And in doing so, we build altars on which to idolize ourselves and our way of doing things. We make, God in, uh, we make a God in our image instead of following the God who made us in his image. In this, our supposed freedom is only superficial. In summary, there is zero credibility to superficial Christianity. 
You can look saved but not be saved. You can repent, be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins and filled with the Holy Ghost and by all appearances by fo- be following the leading of the Lord. But then you go on to gossip about other people. You go on to murmur about the leaders. You don't like how things are being done and so you just have to tell everybody about it. It doesn't just damage the person you're speaking ill of. It damages you. It damages how other per- others perceive you. You're not trustworthy. You're not dependable. You're just another big mouth. You speak life to a rumor, but in turn, you speak death to your own reputation. For the church to be a safe refuge from this world, the church must be distinct from the world. And if the only distinction is appearance, there's not really a distinction. If the only thing that makes us different is how we look, there is no distinction. Because anybody can dress up nice. It's super easy to talk about people behind their backs. It's super easy to listen to rumors and spread them. It's not easy to break free of the mob mentality and shut down gossip when you hear it. But it's the right thing to do. It's not easy to speak up when you're one of only two who have faith in your leader's ability to hear from God while the other ten have an opposing view, but it's the right thing to do. So instead of putting forth effort into hurting someone behind their back, why not put that effort into building them up to their face? All that effort, all that that energy you put into, ooh, this sounds really good. I got to go tell ten other people now about what I just heard. Whether or not it's true, I don't care. Sounds good. Sounds interesting. I'm going to go spread it. Or say, don't want to hear it. Sorry. Thanks, but no thanks. And then walk up to the person who just, you know, somebody saying something bad about or whatever, walk up to them, say, hey, you know what? I'm praying for you today. I feel like... I feel like there's a lot less effort in in that. There's a lot less effort in being nice to someone. I, I, I don't know if it's we we just you know we our own pride gets in the way or or we're you know we're 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 shy or we're afraid of how it'll be received. I'd rather I'd rather be rejected for being nice to somebody than than accepted for spreading rumors about them. So so. What does the Bible say on the other side of the coin? I, I, I've spent a lot of time uh, with, with why we shouldn't spread rumors, why we shouldn't say, uh, you know, speak ill of people and, and be gossips and, and, and the, you know, why we should break free from, from the mob mentality. Uh, but, but the Bible does have something to say on the other side of the coin. So let's look at that and then we're going to pray. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. If you look up the health benefits of of honey, just straight honey, there's quite a, a long list. Kind words are like honey. They are sweet to the soul and they are healthy for the body. Romans 14 and 19. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. There, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. I don't have the exact scripture reference, but I believe it's Paul that says to follow peace with all men, to, to, to pursue peace with all men. This does not mean that you have to agree with everything they say. This does not mean that you have to uh, you have to uh, agree with their lifestyle. You you don't have to agree with their beliefs. What it does mean is you should treat them with respect. What it does mean is you should treat them as you would want to be treated. It does mean that you should be kind. You should speak kindly to them. You should be respectful. You should show the love of Christ toward toward that person. Whether or not you agree with them is 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 irrelevant. We need to pursue peace, to follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 
And that's, that's echoed in, in Romans 14, 19, to aim for harmony in the church, try to build each other up. Ephesians 4 and 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Col- uh, Colossians 4 and 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Your words carry weight. What you say matters. What you say matters. It is a matter of life and death. It's, it's, not, just, it's not just life or death of the person you're speaking of, but it's life or death for you as well. If we go back to our original text, Proverbs 18 and 20, Man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. Wise words satisfy like a good meal. The right words bring satisfaction. And with the increase of his lips, he shall be filled. That's uh, the NLT. The right right words bring satisfaction. Verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. There is a a biblical principle all throughout Scripture of sowing and reaping. And this applies to what you say. This applies to what you speak. It applies to to what you tell people, to to who you tell it, how you tell it, what you say. We have to, just as much as we have to guard our, our minds and guard our hearts, we have to guard our mouths. We have to guard our speech. Especially in this day and age, we have to, we have to, uh, yeah, we need to be bold. We need to, we need to follow the great commission. We need to preach the gospel. We need to teach all nations. We, we are commissioned. We are commanded by Jesus to do those things, but there's a way to go about it. There's a way to go about it. It, it, There there is a a need for tact. Again, Scripture says to follow peace with all men, and if you just go wailing a Bible at someone's head and expect them to get it, you're going to lose them. Let's all stand. Some of you are are probably familiar with this, this acronym, uh, teachers probably a little more so uh, think before you speak. Randy, have you have you are you familiar with this using think as an acronym? Do you do you remember what they all are off the top of your head? Yes, four for five. Eighty, you get an eighty percent. Is that a, a B or a C? I don't, I don't know what the no. uh, Yeah, so uh, I'm sure you all have heard the, the just the phrase "think before you speak," right? You should think before you speak. Well, if you if you take the word "think" as an acronym, um, the letter T, is it true? H, is it honest? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? And K, is it kind? Is what I'm about to say true, first and foremost? Is it honest? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? I I will be the first to admit, I say plenty of things that are not necessary got in trouble in school a lot for it got okay grades but you know a lot of times on the back it'd be like you know michael's a he's a pretty good student but he should stop talking to people should stop distracting other people i i could sit here and and speculate and and rattle on you know about all the different reasons why I think church attendance is is 
suffering. Not just our specific congregation, but across the country. There was a, a, a Gallup poll. Uh, Gallup's been, been measuring this since uh, the mid-70s, I believe. And for the first time in around 40 years, uh, church membership is under 50% in the United States. Less and less people are going to church. And, and it, is, it is pretty heavily uh, striated. It's, it's heavily skewed with, with age. There are traditionalists, you know, people who are a little bit older tend to go to church because, you know, if, if for no other reason, faithfulness. It's just what they've always done. It's part of their lives. And so they continue to go to church. But as, as these metrics start to show younger and younger people, it starts to show less and less church membership that goes along with that, that age difference. And again, there are a number of factors. It's not just one. It's not just one thing. There are a number of factors. But for the sake of, of what I'm talking about here today, I would say that one of those factors is is distinction. If people really are hungry for God, if people really want to find a, a, a church, if they really want to find out what it's like to live for God, what it's like to be around believers, other people who, 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 who have the same mindset and all who, who worship God and, and live by a, 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 a basic moral standard that's set in the word of God. But then they come here and they start hearing us talking about each other. And they come here and they start hearing, hearing gossip about so-and-so and look out for this person. Look out. It, it happens at my job. I've got a, a, a team right now. I think our team's up to 13 or 14 guys. And, you know, we get a new guy in. And then you have a couple of people who are like, yeah, so you should watch out for this guy. He does this, this, and this, and this. And you should, you know, this guy, he, talk, he says these things. And he's like kind of a jerk. And then this guy does this. And, and you have a new guy who just started, and, and a couple days in, he's already got his, his mind made up about what it's going to be like to work with these other guys because he's just heard nothing but blah, 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 blah. And then he goes in with this expectation and then is surprised when it turns out, hey, it's not actually like that, or it's not as bad as so-and-so made it out to be. We do the same thing here. And then we wonder why people don't come. There's no distinction. There's no difference. If I want to hear people gossip about each other, if I want to see people pitted against each other, I can just walk out and watch the news. It's just like everybody else. It's up to us to shut down the gossip. It's up to you individually to shut down the gossip. It's up to you to, to, to stand up when, when your leaders stand up and speak out in faith. It's up to you to stand alongside them, whether, whether or not you're convinced that what you're hearing from your leaders is, is, is you know, from the, from the voice of God. I'm going to trust them anyway because they're my leaders. I'm going to stand with them because they're my leaders, because they're the people who God has put in my life as my spiritual covering. So instead of putting effort into speaking doubt about what seems impossible by every tangible metric, why not put that effort into speaking faith as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen? Twelve men were sent to confirm the promise of God, but only two saw the promise in their possession. If we want the promises of God to manifest in this church, it's going to take more than two of us to believe it's going to happen. It's going to take more than two of us to speak that it will happen. It was the, the ten who spoke out in doubt, the ten who spoke out against the promise of God that left everybody else wandering in the wilderness. 
until until these ten and and their their families and that generation was wiped out. That was their punishment. You doubt that I'm you seen the promise. You now doubt that I'm going to give it to you. Well, you're right. You spoke it. Now you get to eat the fruit thereof. I do not want to. Myself and a few others have been here from the very beginning. I don't want to see, I don't want to see that happen anymore. I don't want to see it happen where, where everybody else is wandering in the wilderness. Because a few people can't keep their mouth shut. They're not here to say it, and, and, and they probably wouldn't say it even if they were here. But our pastor and his wife are tired. And they're hurting. And they're holding themselves accountable before the Lord for every soul that's walked in these doors and walked right back out. And I'm here to tell you it is not to be their burden alone. I'm here to tell you that while they are our leaders, they are not the only ones who are supposed to be putting in the work. I am here to tell you that, that while, yeah, they, they, they need to teach Bible studies and they need to, to reach the lost, all of us have to do that. And when we do have more people come in and we have a, a new face and we have first-time guests, it's, it's not up to two people to, 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 to keep that going it is up to all of us to build relationships it's up to all of us to make disciples the great commission was not just for people who were pastoring a church the command from jesus was not just to two people leading a a local congregation to to teach all nations to make disciples to baptize that's not just supposed to be on the same two people We can have all kinds of people walk in. We can have a, 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 a revival service and have a hundred people show up, but it doesn't make a difference if, if they don't stick around. And one of, the, one of the, the, the most surefire things you can do to help them stick around is to shut down the gossip, shut down the backbiting, shut down the ill-speaking of other people, ill-speaking of our leaders, And when you do speak to people, you speak life. Because while there is death in the power of the tongue, there is life in the power of the tongue. There is, we have the ability, we have the authority under the name of Jesus Christ to speak things into existence. When God spoke creation into existence. He spoke everything except for us, which he formed. He spoke it into creation. He spoke life into the universe. The first time we, we have record of the devil speaking, he speaks lies and he speaks deceit and, and he speaks death that's right he's a copycat but when the but when the devil spoke is his first the, the the first record of the devil speaking when he spoke he spoke unto death it's up to us 
to speak life. It's up to us to speak life to one another. It's up to us to, to, to take that authority that's been granted us. Greater works shall you do in my name. Let's all lift our hands. Every, every eye closed, every hand lifted across this room. Lord Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Before I do anything else, before I say anything else, I need your forgiveness. I need your forgiveness for the, the things that I've spoken against my brother or my sister. I need your forgiveness, Lord, for, 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 for listening to the, the junk and then passing it on and, and being being uh, complicit in, in lies and rumors that are spread and being complicit of uh, uh, speaking ill of my brother or my sister, Lord. I need your forgiveness. Because I realize how much damage what I say can do. I realize now, Lord, that my words carry more weight than I thought they did. And I, I, I may not have thought about it at the time that I was speaking, but Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I ask, Lord, uh, for your forgiveness. And I ask, Lord, that you would forgive those who have spoken ill against me. <laughs> they may never come to apologize to me, but that's okay. I forgive. I release forgiveness I want forgiveness to flow freely from me Lord <laughs> forgive us as we forgive others I thank you Lord for the ability to speak I thank you Lord for the gift of language there's so much good that can be done with it. But like, like anything else, when it's abused, it, it, it turns evil. It turns sour. I don't want corrupt communication coming from my mouth. I don't want to speak ill of people, Lord. And right now, I commit to you. I'm going to do my best day in and day out to think before I speak. To, to allow your word, to allow scripture to be the filter through which I speak. 